Hello, Prestige Heads, and welcome to American Prestige. I'm Danny Bessner, here as always with my friend and comrade, Derek Davison. And we're very excited to welcome to the podcast, Penny Von Eschen. Penny is a professor of history and the William R. Keenan Jr. Professor in American Studies at the University of Virginia in the Department of History, and the author of Paradoxes of Nostalgia, Cold War Triumphalism and Global Disorder Since 1989. Penny, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. So here's just with the first question, what inspired you to write this book? You're a historian, you focus most on your work, not on the, on the more recent past, but what about the world today <laughs> uh, inspired you to write about nostalgia in the Cold War? Yeah, thanks for that question. So the idea of the book started to congeal in the early 2000s as the U.S. was at war with Afghanistan and then went into Iraq. And at the moment, I was finishing an earlier book, Satchmo Blows Up the World. And I remember um, in 2003 finishing that and writing about Duke Ellington in Baghdad at a moment when the U.S. had actually intervened and helped to overthrow a government and then they couldn't control it, so they didn't quite get their way. And just the kind of the utter tragedy of this repetition, the lack of knowledge of the history, but just overwhelmingly in, in that moment of war, I was just profoundly disturbed by, I mean, I was an historian. I'd done two books on the Cold War, intersecting with anti-colonial, with colonialism and anti-colonialism. I was so disturbed at the obvious distortions of history, both the distortions that were used as a justification for weapons of mass destruction and going into Iraq, but a very systematic distortion of the U.S. past in this entire region and, and globally. And along with those distortions, I kept hearing um, a weird mix of what I see as triumphalism and nostalgia. Um, oh, I miss the Cold War. It, it was so much safer and so much stable. We knew who our enemies were, which is profoundly obscene as millions and millions of people died in conflicts in Latin America, in Africa, in, in Southeast Asia, through, throughout Asia. And um, along with this kind of distorted triumphalism, I was also, um, well, this distorted nostalgia, I was also hearing a triumph, you know, this as a justification for newly going to war. I was hearing a triumphalism. You know, we won the Cold War because of our military strength, because we didn't hold back, because we were, you know, willing to pull out our military might. Therefore, we must do this again. So it was, it was those two combinate, it, it was that combination um, in a very disturbing moment and then kind of slightly independent, but I don't think altogether unrelated phenomenon was that this is a moment when there was kind of a burst of um, what people called nostalgia in East Germany, a lot of expressions of nostalgia for the values and stability of the Cold War era in the Eastern Bloc. And the American or the U.S. commentary was constantly just saying, oh, the, the, those people are out of their minds. How could they possibly miss that horrible, horrible era? What There's nothing to miss about it. So there was a disdain for Eastern Bloc expressions of nostalgia. And I talk about that nostalgia. It, it wasn't nostalgia for authoritarian regimes, but it was almost nostalgia for political hope, nostalgia for the reform movements for nostalgia for a time when not everything was defined by the market and about money. So you're getting this U.S. disdain for Eastern Bloc forms of nostalgia while seemingly completely missing the fact that Americans were awash in their own nostalgia. So I thought, this is all very weird, and I just, this really needs to be investigated. And of course, this is a moment with a lot of calls to global history. So what would it really mean to really push in many different ways on kind of U.S. from the outside in, the American impact, like what does it look like when American triumphalism travels into former Soviet spaces? So let's, you know, find 
I call it globally framed. It's not about the whole world or everything, but let's really look at these critical sites where this kind of triumphalism, intervention, and nostalgias are operating. And really, what is that about? How did that happen? Let's investigate that. So obviously, nostalgia is a key conceptual category. How do you use nostalgia and and what do you mean by it? What is the uh, effective dimension of it? Well, I think there's a lot of different ways that nostalgia operates, and I'll quickly get to some of the dominant affective dimensions. But I I think it is important, and I do I make a distinction between I think two over two very important senses and maybe two dominant senses of nostalgia. And one is what I think can be a critical nostalgia. And I see this as perhaps a more, you know, affective form. Well, they're all affective, but the critical nostalgia, which I think came both, um, there's expressions in both the West and the East, but the critical nostalgia could be um, a, a real look at um, the world changed very quickly, um, kind of went, went wrong. And you see this in expressions of, you, you might see in the Eastern Bloc, for example, but also in the West, you know, I, I used to have a job, I used to have health care. Um, and people often use the language, life was more continuous, not everything was about money. Um, we didn't have a lot, we were, you know, we didn't like the state, but our my relationships were richer. Intimacy was just a lot more, you know, our, you know, just much richer. So, so there's a way to say, what changed? And that's a good historical question that leads to critical inquiry. What changed? What went wrong? And let's look at what has been lost that was of value. And I think you could really see a critical nostalgia also in going back to the period of change. So the the uh, what I think like of the some of the very important reformers of that period, and this is not all of them, but Václav Havel, Mikhail Jor- Gorbachev, Nelson Mandela, um, sort of the anti-apartheid movement. All of these movements had critiques of authoritarian um, f- governments in both its uh, communist bloc forms as well as its uh, capitalist imperialist forms. And they all wanted, the, they all said, there's something's gone very wrong in this Cold War period. There's been horrible military destruction. There's been horrible environmental waste. And this is both militarism and a race to consumption. So we really need to say, um, you know, we we must examine that and we must not repeat that. So it's not a nostalgia that everything was great, but part of the critical nostalgia was a nostalgia for those very serious critical reform movements. And again, I, I say nostalgia is always dangerous because even a critical nostalgia can morph into something which reifies an invented and simplified past. And part of what I do is trace various moments when critical nostalgias morph into a nostalgia that claims like the form in the United States, you know, that there was a, you know, we were absolutely right. We had all the answers. This was, you know, glorifies a past, overlooks all of its flaws. And one of my chapters looks at patterns of claims, especially in the Eastern Bloc, but putting that in conversation with the West. And I think one of the things that I saw over the course of the 2000s is multiple sites and museums, Hungary, Poland, Lithuania, where I think there were, and and I think Russia is a really important example of this, where there were genuine calls, there were genuine open queries into, let's let's examine this past with all of its warts, all of its, you know, let's not cover up the horror, but let's, you know, so we had you know, there was political repression, we had great ballet and hockey, let's look at all elements of this. And then those, um, and I, I think of one example in, in a political museum in St. Petersburg in 2008, it, um, and, but this could be echoed in, in really interesting parks in, in, um, in Budapest, in, um, outside of Vilnius, you get, um, you get real invitations to, to really examine this past critically and really. These are the famous monument parks, right? We're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but then in kind of in conjunction with sort of a global turn to more authoritarian governments in some of these very places, you then see, um, that critical inquiry really taken out and you get very strong stories of victimization. So, um, so 
Poland's a strong example, but Russia is so ironic because um, I had a really kind of an accidental chance to go back to um, this museum in St. Petersburg and to Moscow in 2017. And by this point, Putin is already constructing the Russians as the biggest victims of the Soviets of everybody. So you've got very, very strong um, claims of victimization. And in all these cases, um, um, Poland, Hungary, Russia, they're hearkening back to this kind of mythic past of a of sort of sort of a pure um, ethnically reg- religiously defined country that is now in the in this story under threat by whether it's Western values. And I think a lot of the conditions for that turn came from the enormous destabilization um, that comes from the U.S. wars in the Middle East, and then. Iraq spilling into Syria, spilling into genuine refugee crises, which right-wing politicians took up as um, extremely xenophobic um, claims against outsiders and really, you know, helped their claims for, um, again, this very pure mythic past. No, that's that's really helpful. Let's let's now return for a second to the book and, and the first substantive chapter, great introduction, but right after the intro is a, a chapter titled The Ends of History, where you examine this, these disagreements between the Americans and these three foreign visitors who came to the United States in order to define this post-Cold War geopolitical order. Could you first talk about the end of history as a concept and why you t- t- uh, titled your chapter The Ends of History and how these three figures and their, you know, the various debates, at least implicitly with uh, George H.W. Bush, informed the post-Cold War, you know, set the stage as it were for the post-Cold War world. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so just to start in a really simple way, I, I, I just kind of play with the ends of history because um, I think uh, unlike maybe some more casual observers of George H.W. Bush. I actually see Bush as an incredibly calculated, if not sort of masterful craftsperson of the uses and abuses of history, keenly aware of the purposes to which history is put as he moves through various political stages. So it's very much about sort of the uses of history. And so the end of history is obviously uh, the big buzzword in this period with people picking up Fukuyama's um, notion of the end of history and this notion that that with the collapse of an Eastern Bloc or the weakening first of an Eastern Bloc, that all big ideological questions in history have been solved and that the only path, that everyone's agreed, the claim goes, that the only path to a modern future is in a liberal capitalist democracy society. And I would, you know, I don't think we can emphasize strongly enough that, you know, despite Fukuyama's later evolution and latter day claims in this moment, capitalism was just completely conflated with democracy. So those things really, really came together. And I think the really important thing for me is that because of the power of neoliberalism, how much this deregulated new mode of economy really swept through the globe, we can look back as if it's inevitable. But in fact, there was so much more on the table. And that, that completely, that notion completely belies and violates the dominant vision of the, of the reformers. So I think, so I look at the visits of um, Hobble and Mandela and also um, to a lesser extent, um, um, look, I look at Poland to a lesser extent and also, um, certainly look at Gorbachev and his visions and how those collided with Bush's. But what's, what's interesting about this period and this rapid moment of contingency, Havel is imprisoned, but at the end, still in prison in 98, gets out of prison, becomes president. He comes to the States in February, Mandela and this very, Right before Havel comes, Mandela has been released from prison. Mandela then visits in June of 1990. So you have this rapid succession of these, you know, of these um, reforming heroes. And we can come back to Gorbachev's very triumphant visit just before, you know, he's been in the United States. He's still a real darling of of Americans. And um, so... And the, the vision is 
that's projected by Gorbachev and Havel and Mandela, and I'll talk more about Havel and Mandela here, is very strongly that of a radical need for demilitarization, that the military excess and buildup of the Cold War has caused great destruction, enormous environmental damage, uh, great economic inequality, and that there's also a real critique of consumption, you know, that, that we have to rethink the good life. This race consumption has produced mounds of garbage. It's destroyed the environment. So environmentalism goes hand in hand with this new, um, with an emphasis on demilitarization. And there's also both, especially Mandela, but also Hobble are putting a redistributive agenda on the table and especially Mandela. So yes, they, they, they want, in the words of like Hobble and the Eastern reformers, they want socialism with a human face. They do not want unregulated, untrammeled capitalism. Um, they're not jumping onto the capitalist ba- bandwagon. And they recognize the problems in central planning. They absolutely want, um, you know, they, they absolutely want a sort of mixed market reforms in the places where appropriate, but those re- market reforms were never intended to go into basic human rights, healthcare, education. Um, and um, so this was, you know, this was all supposed to be preserved and 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 strengthened. So so Havel, um, Havel's visit is very um, is just very interesting because Havel is saying that these Cold War institutions are irrelevant. We we need to abolish the Warsaw Pact, abolish NATO, and this sends this infuriates Bush. It sends all sorts of Americans into kind of an enormous state of alarm, and so there's a whole little kind of like dances, you know, kind of little you know kind of dances around that. Where, um, but it makes very very clear how much um, how much this demilitarization is on the table. When Mandela then visits, there's some real deep confrontations with Bush over, um, you know, both over, um, well, the, the big issues are that Mandela is refuse, you know, refuses to denounce um, the military arm of the ANC and denounce any use of political violence. And so Bush is really trying to dictate the terms. So like you absolutely must, must denounce political, any form of, of, of violence. And Mandela says, look, if this, if we had any political rights, if we had any political civil rights, of course we would never, ever, ever use violence, but we absolutely have no political civil rights. So we, we absolutely have a right to, to self-defense. The, and the other big issue is, um, um, <clears throat> sorry. And then the other issue is Mandela and the ANC's insistence on economic justice and redistribution. And this also greatly alarms Bush and, and many other people. And, um, it's it, there, you know. There's um, like Thatcher in Britain, for example, is also you know, the her advisors are telling Mandela, do not use the word nationalization in front of Thatcher. You can't speak in these terms. And over time, um, Mandela and the ANC, um, I think you know, maybe tragically, become convinced that if they don't give up certain demands for nationalization in, in some areas and redistribution, they will not get any investment. And um, so, but this this continues to be a very very important um, bone of contention between Mandela and Bush. And the and then another issue which is is very wrapped up in this is it's wrapped up in demilitarization is that. It, it's really about the United Nations and the role of sort of a non-aligned third world bloc in the United Nations. And Bush, along with a lot of other Americans, are appalled that Mandela will not denounce Castro, Yasser Arafat. And Mandela says, look, these, are, these people were our allies. They supported us in this horrible period of apartheid when, you know, when nobody else did. And I'm not going to, you know, we're not going to denounce them. But I think this is really important because after Iraq and Saddam Hussein invade Kuwait and as Bush is 
pushing globally for a military alliance that will back the United States in going to war in Iraq rather than getting a negotiated settlement or a time settlement. Initially, the the dominant view globally and certainly at the UN was that we must have a negotiated settlement that would involve broader um, peace in the Middle East and issues of Palestinian rights. Saddam Hussein was happy, happy to talk about a, ti- a timeline for settlement and withdrawal, but for various reasons, Bush Bush did not, you know, Bush would not, did not, w- would not have this. And, and I think um, he really saw this as a moment when the U.S. could declare its unilateral power over both this broader third world bloc and Gorbachev, who supported negotiated settlements, um, as well as I think, you know, Bush had a very strong antipathy toward uh, this third world bloc in the United Nations and really kind of wanted to assert U.S. dominance and put that to rest. So I think all of those things played out. And I mean, the Penny, last just else, a quick question. Yeah, of just course. A quick, um, it just, so basically, like we historians, you know, you could tell this very complex story, but in the end, tell me if I'm wrong, but what I'm hearing is like Bush wanted domination and that was that. You know, like there was all these other things and there were all these other, you know, flows and people moving and debates. But in the end, Bush wanted to fucking dominate the world. And that was and he was going to bulldoze anyone who disagreed with that. Is that wrong? Well, in in a sense, I think in a sense, I think it's not wrong. I mean, because um, Bush Bush wanted and um, you know, Bush told his advisors, you know, there are no longer two superpowers in the world. There's only one. You know, yeah, we're you know, going to dominate it, and this know, is are, the dream, the, and, and who cares right. what Mandela says? Well, a- absolutely, and I think, and he was going to kind of d- dominate anyone who's not in line. Now, I'll, and it's not really a caution against that. I just, Bush really moved through what I see as a very clever carrot and stick diplomacy. So he's, like, he's going to hovel and saying, you know, I know, like, I think, Bush is probably thinking something like, I know human rights are really important to Havel. So I'm going to here, I'm going to emphasize the abuses of human rights by Iraq. Here, I'm going to threaten somebody with, you know, impoverishment or, you know, or, you know, or intervention if they don't kind of go along with me. But I think he, I think he was very, very aggressive in kind of getting his way in the vision as a U.S. as a unipolar power. And I also, this is obviously deeply tied up with oil. So going into Iraq, being able to, in his mind, maintain access to oil and, you know, from his perspective, they were not about to abandon this, you know, the U.S. is so ensconced in a deep carbon, oil, military, industrial complex. And of course, the military, you know, the military, in some sense, they cut back in some ways, it got you know, you could talk about it as meaner and leaner, but they did not demilitarize in any, I, I think, you know, really in any, in any deep, m- meaningful sense. Well, that's all because of the mil- revolution in military affairs too, right? It's right. coincident. Right. So they're right. like, they, they think we'll do the same exact thing for slightly cheaper. Turns out they'll have that and they'll just balloon the budget. Because I basically, because to me, like, I know like after the postmodern turn, we're, we're all skeptical of master narratives. But it, again, this just seems like you could fit this pretty easily into the master narrative of since 1941, the U.S. wanted to dominate the world. And it basically every choice except for maybe a few years in the 1970s at every decision point they just made the decision to expand the domination i guess that's kind of what i'm getting at you know trying to look at this holistically from 2023 yeah i mean i think i mean i think both following following reagan and and um but i think george h w bush again a background in the cia a background in oil but i think bush was absolutely resolute that the United States had the right and should be the only person setting the terms of the globe and that anybody who really disagreed had to be gotten out of the way, whether that was turning on former clients in Panama or Saddam Hussein, who'd been an ally for so long, but just absolutely resolute. And I think now when I say, you know, I, I do think it's important to emphasize uh, divisions within the U.S. government and, you 
So I do, I try to pay for attention. Sure, for sure. Yeah, the state most, isn't holistic. Yeah, totally. Yeah, absolutely. So this is, um, so this is a very strong view that is, um, you know, very intolerant of, um, it, it is basically intolerant of the UN too, because it does it, it's intolerant of global institutions because the United States, you know, they, these global institutions should not be dictating to the United States in the view of somebody like George H.W. Bush. And the way you see this very concretely is even in the eighties, which is such an interesting contested politics when there's, you know, when, when Reagan is going, you know, greatly expanding the military, going into Central America, South Africa, just really ratcheting up militarism in so many different places. Um, Afghanistan, I mean, we could just go on. um, But it's, um, you know, you've got, you've got very strong critics in Congress. This is very hotly debated, but, and because Congress, um, so, but one thing that happens under, under Reagan is basically the U.S. stops paying their dues to the U.N. So there's all sorts of ways to undermine these organizations. And then- And we leave UNESCO every, what, seven to 10 years? It's like the thing that U.S. presidents love doing. <laughs> no, absolutely. So, I, and I say, like, even though, like, it, it was very outrageous that Trump to leave the World Health Organization and the Paris Climate Agreements, but there's a real precedent. There's a real precedent to that. And in fact, you know, in the in the 90s, um, when, you know, again, there's a tug of war between more global, you know, more globally cooperative and international forces. But once again, after um, after Newt Gingrich and contract for America, once the Republicans took Congress, they were once again not paying UN dues and they were overtly undermining diplomatic agreements that other you know, parts of the U.S. government were really working on not going to war with Korea. It's a, this agreed frame under the Clinton framework, but that was getting subtly undermined by people simply refusing to pay if Congress controls the purse, the purse strings. So I think that's a very important part of the story. And it also shows that there are alternatives, just like there was a real alternate vision on the table at the end of the Cold War that involved demilitarization, addressing climate, um, um, environmental disaster, that that was on the table then. And there were, you know, there were disagreements and tussles, but, but yes, there was a very, very strong vision of, you know, that the U.S. is the only power and and the world's going to be kind of set under its, under its, you know, dictating to its, um, yeah, its directives. American Prestige is brought to you in partnership with The Nation magazine. Please consider becoming a subscriber at AmericanPrestigePod.com forward slash subscribe. As a subscriber, you'll get access to dozens of exclusive bonus episodes, including breaking news specials, deep dives into regional histories, analysis of movies and video games, and much more. And if you subscribe at the founders level, you'll be able to claim a year digital subscription to the nation. Thank you for listening. And now back to the show. Penny, let's get into to chapter two, which really talks about the 90s. And uh, I love this because the 90s were like my formative political years. And it's Derek's such an a 90s time. Kid. <laughs> it's the, I mean, this is the unipolar moment. It's the time when Washington decides that uh, instead of dismantling this military machine we've built over the Cold War, what if we used it for good things? What if we did nice stuff with it? Uh, and so you talk about Somalia, you talk about the the decision not to intervene in Rwanda, you talk about Yugoslavia and the breakup of Yugoslavia. Uh, but it's also the era of the the clash of civilizations rhetoric, which is, you know, sort of Samuel Huntington's response to Fukuyama, the idea that we're not fighting over ideology anymore, okay, but we're going to go back to an earlier time sort of fighting over these kind of fundamental civilizational values, cultural, religious, etc., but as you note, that that phrase, which had been kicking around for for a long time, but but Huntington gets it from Bernard Lewis, who again kind of puts me in flashbacks of grad school. But he gets it from Bernard Lewis specifically from an article called "The Roots of Muslim Rage." So this is like it, specifically referring to this uh, supposed incompatibility of Western liberalism and Islam, essentially. Uh, can you talk about these two strains of thinking and uh, how they kind of juxtapose with one another or interact to produce what we see in, in the U.S. in the 90s? Uh, 
Absolutely. And by too strange, you mean kind of end of ideology and the clash of civilizations. Right. And, and then sort of this this impulse to do humanitarian intervention, which I always think is such a weird concept, but uh, was was really dominant in this period. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let me start with the clash of civilizations. Um, so, yeah, you're right. It, it's it. I mean, it's I mean, this is a reinvention of very old civilization ideas, but it's just remarkable how fast that's kind of pulled out when when U.S., when people on many in many different registers are saying, oh, what do we do without the communist enemy? We need an enemy. Like, And how quickly people move to this idea of this this threat of, you know, the non-civilized. And, and interestingly, I mean, I'm interested in, well, I'm interested in how many different registers that work that's working in because the very week that um, Lewis's article, The Roots of Muslim Rage, come out in um, the Atlantic, George H.W. Bush gives his um, his kind of strategic vision speech in which he talks about the threat in Iraq of the rule of the jungle overwhelm, overwhelming the rule of law. And this is, this is a clash between the rule of law and the rule of the jungle. And of course, Reagan's use this civilizationist language too, and they're, they're pulling this back in. And, and, and I mean, we should just stop and say how, how, just how ridiculous and ahistorical Bernard Lewis is. And so he's, he's making a claim. He overtly makes a claim. I that trust any Princeton professor until the day I die. I don't know. Penny. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it, it's, it's completely historical because he's overtly saying that there's something so there's something so irrational here. It cannot possibly be explained by any political or policy circumstance. And, and um, so um, and he basically then he kind of basically equates, um, you know, all all of Islam through all of history gets like get you know gets reduced to this really ridiculous reified idea. But um, but again, this starts to operate in in many different registers because you're getting this idea of this this fear of Islam and an idea of a clash of civilization from from academics, from popularizing pundits like Robert Kaplan, from um, from popular writers like Tom Clancy, who's been this big Cold War novelist and his stuff's getting ad adapted into films. And all of a sudden his new work is imagining this unified Islamic state, bizarrely India, China, and the Middle East, attacking the United States, killing the president. So you're getting this kind of hysteria um, but it's and in in what was considered more kind of sober foreign policy circles, although you know I, it, it it's really um, a very it, it it it's a very irrational idea. I think that's deeply linked to the clash of civilizations. You have the evolution of this rogue state idea, which was around in the Reagan era, but era, but really gets really gets articulated by Anthony Lake in the Clinton administration. So this idea of the rogue misbehaving state who's outside of, they use the language outside of the family of nations and outside of civilization. And with these rogue states, they're utterly irrational. They cannot be trusted. There's no, they, they have no legitimate grievances. It's totally irrational. The only thing to do is to undermine them through sanctions, through discipline or through intervention. I don't know if you want. I don't know if you want to follow up on this, or I could say more about the way this plays out in um, in these early conflicts. In um, yeah, let's. I mean, let's talk about the early conflicts, and yeah. particularly, like I'm. I'm. I've always been interested with you know the the example of let's say Somalia, and and what was really a failed intervention. I mean, the U.S. had to leave kind of in disgrace versus Rwanda and the decision not to intervene and watching what happened there that that seemed like that seemed much more um uh, how do I want to say this impactful on the on the thinking of of folks in DC than the example of Somalia you, you know you could have taken a lesson away from that that the US just isn't equipped to do this kind of thing but it felt like not intervening in Rwanda was was really they took the lesson away from that, that the U.S. has to intervene in situations like this. It must you know, it, we must uh, we're the in indispensable nation. Uh, you know, we have to be involved. 
Right. That right. That there was a a, a humanitarian uh, failure in 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 that sense to intervene, and that was tied up with Bosnia. And so, just just to really you know quickly note what critics at the time noted um, about Somalia is that like so why did the U.S. intervene? And you know obviously um, this is a more it's it's a more complex story of a former Soviet clientele state that then kind of turns to the U.S. but but the, the U.S. had invested, there was a lot of oil investment in, in Somalia. So what, what, what the really good investigative journalists and critics at the moment would have pointed this out. And I think that's absolutely true. But let's, um, but in the case of Rwanda and some, um, and, and, and Bosnia, and in this case, um, I think, one of the things I think we should emphasize about, you know, I, I, I felt like it was very important to look at these broad patterns because I was seeing the same, the same logic in the justifications for intervention and not, inter, you know, intervening or not intervening. So I thought that was really important, but it's also um, very, very, I was very dependent, you know, rightly so. And I think as people do globally framed histories in just kind of, uh, meshing myself in literatures of people that have written deeply on Rwanda and Bosnia. So in the case of Rwanda, um, Mahmoud Wabdani, along with others, I think has been really important. And I think, um, th- so there's two aspects to this argument. And I think th- the first is, um, I think there's this massive evidence that for first and these conflicts like move across the Bush and Clinton administration, but we could focus on Clinton for, you know, in the administration, partly having read Robert Kaplan and listening to other advisors, Clinton and many other people became sadly convinced that, again, it's a clash of civilizations idea that, you know, these people have been fighting with each other for for thousands of years. These are ancient hatreds. These are irrational. There's, there, they, there's, there's no political explanation for them. There's no contemporary, um, yeah, there's no policy or political explanation. They're just irrational hatreds. Therefore, we just can't do anything about it. We're going to wring our hands. It's very unfortunate. Um, now, what, what historians like Woodward in Bosnia and uh, Mahmoud Mandani have shown is that there's there's multiple political causes and political explanations. And it's not all about the United States or the West. But in fact, the, the actions of the West are directly implicated. You cannot understand the breakdown at either Rwanda or Bosnia without understanding policy, you know, going back, you know, in the case of Rwanda, you would go back to earlier colonial policies and the creation of, of sort of artificial creation of ethnicities to rule by pitting one person against another. The more recent causal issues in Rwanda are that the U.S. had actually helped to train and arm um, Ugandan armies, which then intervened and had terrorized the people who became the perpetrators of the violence. So this did not happen in a vacuum. These are not ancient hatreds. And that even as the violence began, um, the the European banks, France and the IMF are all continuing policies, austerity policies that are, you know, just causing enormous suffering, starvation among people. So all sorts of things are leading into creating this horrendous crisis. Yet Clinton and others said, these are ancient hatreds. This is horrible. We can't do anything about it. And then later coming to a profound regret and saying overtly, you know, we could have saved millions of lives. We we just didn't realize it. Now, just a very quick point on Bosnia. Um, so again, um, historians have really tracked, um, you've got Anytime there's a crisis like this, you've got people going back and both inventing but pulling on real historical grievances that go back to World War II. So they're there, but Yugoslavia had been a you know a quite prosperous, peaceful country for a long time. So some of the more immediate causes that the West was involved with was weaponizing global financial instruments like the IMF World Bank in the 80s to try to weaken the Yugoslav economy, and then most immediately really squeezing squeezing the country for on, on debt so 
the federated government could no longer send money to different locales because they're sending, they're funneling them to European banks. So they're getting really, again, squeezed economically at the same time that, you know, politicians are taking advantage of this incredible economic crisis, you know, to kind of stoke ethno-nationalisms. So again, I think, obviously, I mean, I, I could recommend these readings and I unpack this a lot more in the book. So, the, But I think that my fundamental point here is that there are both longer term, but very immediate political consequences, I mean, political causes. And the whole clash of civilizations just said, um, just as, you know, just as Bernard Lewis said so, I think, crudely in, in the Roots of Muslim Rage article, that there are no political causes. There are no policy reasons. This is just irrational hatreds going back you know, hundreds and thousands of years. This and this is, you know, this this is out this is outside of history and civilization. This is, you know, this is the clash of civilizations. That's really fascinating, sort of showing how that whole frame affects the entire structure of what comes next. Let's talk a little bit about chapter three, uh, titled Losing the Good Life, Post-Cold War Malays and the Enemy Within. So Malays, of course, has a, a funny history in recent American political history, usually traced to Jimmy Carter's speech, even though I don't believe he actually uses the word Malays in the speech, but famously known as the Malays speech. So why did you use that word and, and what's going on in, in, the, in the U.S.? in the post-Cold War uh, period and sort of this loss of a sense of mission that had defined, you know, the previous four decades. Yes, thank you. Well, again, it's it's sort of, I think it really, it cuts against this myth of the end of ideology that, and that this was such a happy time when you actually go back and look at the evidence because what you see is, you know, as the um, Soviet Union is pursuing reforms and even as, you know, that the Eastern Bloc starts to unravel, what you have in the United States is crumbling infrastructure, a deep economic crisis. We can think of this, these are all the reasons that George H.W. Bush did not win the election, you know, in 92 and Clinton got elected. And so you've got this sense of, I mean, this, that partly allowed for, um, Again, these critiques, people said, oh, like this, we're, we're in it, we're, we're an economic mess. Our cities are a mess. And it's allowed for hope for the peace dividend. If the cold board's over, maybe we can actually fix this stuff. And there was also a sense, I kind of use this as a, you know, it, and people like talk about this even in a very personal sense or a sense of political identity. People had defined, the United States in relationship to its supposed superiority to the Soviet Union for so long. So if we don't have this enemy, who are we and how do we, how do we recognize, how do we recognize, uh, how do we organize our lives and how do we, um, how do we even, you know, see ourselves? And I, for me, it was important to put that in something of a dialogue and sort of a juxtaposition with the crises going on in the Soviet Union. Because as I say, at one point, you know, in this moment sort of Russians got shock therapy and Americans got credit cards, but it was a, it, you know, it was a very unsettling moment in the, in, in the global political economy. And we know now that that was, that was, that was the, a, a real, the beginning of a burst of enormous growth and in inequality where there were massive winners and losers. But I think, I think the Malay speaks to the real uncertainty about what was coming. And I think, um, one of the things that happened from that was, and again, it, it, you know, when I went back to this and I say back to this, because I did kind of live as a conscious political person through some of this, but I, I really examining things that I, you know, that it kind of, you know, sort of a new and sort of in a fresh way. But one of the interesting things is that the, this is a moment then without the Soviet enemy, some people overtly saying, well, you know, we had to we had to show that we were superior. We had to you know show that we were better than the Soviets. And so, you know this this. Um, but now that the Soviet Union's gone, why do we have to be? Why should we care about racism? Why do we care about equality at all? We really don't have to. And I think in the camp in the ninety two campaign that Bush lost, you really see both 
Bush and then sort of infamously Dan Quayle, really fascinating on crime, on poverty, and really kind of really, really blaming the victim. Just just as we might say there's a parallel that that people are looking at violence globally that's a product of a combination of colonial and Cold War violence and blame, you know, sort of pinning the blame on the victim. Um, you get these big campaigns that, you know, poverty's, you know, poverty is a choice, it's individual responsibility. And so and it's all about the individual. And then when you look at the Republican platform in 92 and then what Gingrich and the House picks up, it's very much an attack on society. It, it's it, and it's a rabid attack on social programs. And and you get this really bizarre language on the intellectual level sort of um, Irving Crystal is saying, global communism has been defeated, but my Cold War is just beginning. I'm going after the bureaucrats. I'm going after the social programs in the United States. We have a Kremlin mentality um, within our government. They accuse Bill Clinton's um, health care of being, you know, this is a socialist plan. You know, so you're getting, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, you're getting, getting this weird hysteria about socialism. And that may all seem like, okay, they didn't win. That's all well and good. But you get those programs carried out once the Republicans are in Congress and their absolute, you know, um, determination to dismantle all New Deal programs and all social programs. Um, And so that is, I think, all of this sense that um, so the Republicans, again, this is a deep paradox. There, we won the Cold War. We were right. And there is something so, so terribly wrong with America. And it is the fault of the Democrats and health care and welfare programs. So that kind of that kind of ugliness really, you know, creeps in very, very early on. So without an external enemy, we really, really turn in on ourselves, especially Black people, poor people. And I think, you know, sociologists and historians have written in really, you know, profound ways about the consequences of the dismantling of the New Deal programs and the aid for families to dependent children. And I think that's that's just incredibly important. And I do see a parallel in the Soviet Union. Again, they're very, very, it's very different. But what happens to people when there's no social safety nets? And I think especially for women and children, people are made dependent on the most conservative institutions. And the U.S., and especially under George W. Bush, ties those programs very overtly, puts them in churches very intentionally. But if you don't have daycare, if you don't have health care, where is your kid going to be dropped off? You know, you're, you're, and so you're, so you get this enormous growth in both growth in church membership in, you know, religious affiliation and, and church memberships. But, but I think, again, it makes especially poor women, you know, either very dependent on their own families, whether those families are, maybe they're loving and supportive, maybe they're abusive. They're dependent on those families or they're dependent on these conservative institutions. Where does that hatred of American society come from? Why do these people hate American society so much? Is it just ideology? Is it that simple? So that turning in on the United States, I don't know. I, 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 do, I do know. I think it's profoundly um, racialized and gendered. So I think it's, it's, and I think some people would argue that from, you know, the very moment that school integration was um, achieved to some extent from Brown versus Board of Ed, as, as you know, of course, there was still a real struggle for integration. But as Black people entered the public schools, people said, we're not giving any more money to those public schools. So I think it's it's profoundly connected to racism. It's profoundly connected to sort of misogyny that's directly you know directed against um sort of a uh the idea that feminism or women <laughs> women's movement have you know ruined you know a certain kind of society but i think i think that gets really reshuffled and reconfigured you know it, it really does get reshuffled and reconfigured in the aftermath you know of the cold war as you see these very overt 
you know, really overt attacks. And, um, and again, it, 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 I, it's hard to draw a clear causal line, but by at the, you know, at the January 6th insurrection and everything surrounding it and what happened during the pandemic, it just astounds me how a whole block of people like who are their targets? They're going after public school teachers. They're going after healthcare workers. So this notion of like the Kremlin being an authoritarianism and control being hidden in these, I think these very, very precious institutions, you know, society is what holds us together as human beings. But I think it it gets very sharply articulated um, by, you know, by in, in that platform in 92, in those campaigns and it's um, just very striking how and how sort of quickly people, again, turned in and on themselves, which and I don't want to exaggerate. There was certainly conflict before that. And it doesn't, you know, but but it's sort of the container of those tensions and ideas were, you know, either collapsed or were really reshuffled um, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So I think this will be a good place to end. And, and Penny, we look forward to having you back on a future episode. But of course, the, the first word in the title is paradoxes. So I, I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about this anti-government feeling that takes off in the 90s while there's this remilitarization, because there was contestation, you know, someone like Pat Buchanan, so-called paleoconservatism, you know, someone like Murray Rothbard, paleolibertarianism, were genuinely arguing against having this empire of bases. Um, right. So right. Could, how do you talk about that, that contradiction between this anti-government feeling on the one hand, but then this pro-government, i.e. pro-military feeling on the other? Do you have any thoughts about that? Well, I think it's always, I mean, it's always been a kind of a deep contradiction. And I think, um, and I now I'm just kind of thinking out loud, because when I think about that in the 90s, that that's the most striking thing about Reagan's ideology, right? Because Reagan is the, you know, the per- first person who says we are dismantling, you know, the New Deal, get get the monkey of government off people's back when the military increased exponentially. So he, so he, under Reagan, the state grew at just an exorbitant rate even. So I think that really, that really deeply hits that kind of contradiction. And I think, on a more, um, and again, that's radically different than somebody like Eisenhower, who at least recognized that, you know, this is a problem for democracy. We've created a military industrial complex and we got to really look at the consequences of this. So he says uh, after he creates said complex. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, absolutely. But, but it's, it's very different, right? Ideologically or rhetorically to, you know, than, than what Reagan's doing. And I think that there is, um, Again, again, a part of this paradox is, and I think, you know, some people call this, you know, paranoid empire is this very, again, contradictory sense that we're both the, you know, only legitimate power, the most powerful power, but that we are always at risk of victimization or being invaded. So, and in this era, then you get this, you know, the, the idea that, uh, of clash of civilizations. So this tension between, again, claiming to be the most powerful, but always claiming to be a great threat. George W. Bush's campaign, he was really talking to those terms in such interesting ways because he was saying, you know, and I, I'm, I better maybe paraphrase the Bushisms, like, like when I was coming up, we knew we had enemies, but we knew who they were, we knew where they were. And now, We don't know, you know, and and he says it was us and them. And this is a nostalgia. It's like, we really, it was really clear. That was really good. And now we don't know who the them are. We know they're out there. We don't know who them are. And so he's really spinning out this sense of foreboding. And we now we know a lot of his advisors were already like, they're trying to go back into Iraq and they're trying to, you know, so they're, they're kind of running with this vision of, of an intervention in um, Iraq and toppling Saddam Hussein, and that that's a plan long before 9-11. But I think that that gets that, and he has the sort of same sense that got articulated by Reagan and then George H.W., like, we won through military might. I will 
George H.W. says, I will never let this country be weak again. We, we are, we're the strongest, we're going to stay strong through the military, but we're, we're really, you know, the jungle is encroaching, we're under threat. And, you know, and some, I mean, some historians would locate that in a very long history of just settler colonialism, wars against indigenous Americans, and sort of moments of an idea of a sort of white civilization against a threat that goes far back. In this book, I'm 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 much more interested in the immediate contingencies and the um but I I, I do think we need to take, you know, very seriously how and why does a civilizationist idea and language come up so quickly, like once again, not that it's ever been banished, but it's certainly not dominant in either public discourse or in the popular culture um, of the 80s and 90s. So um, it's just remarkable. And I think it's, um, so I was just really interested in investigating how that came up again and how that comes up in, in multiple registers across political speech, popular culture, and um, so many, so many different, um, so many different areas. Penny Von Eschen, thank you so much for joining us. Everyone check out Paradoxes of Nostalgia. Uh, Penny, I don't know if you remember, but I saw you give an early talk on it at Cornell in like 2014. It was so cool then. And just to see the execution now, it's really a fantastic book that I think would be uh, useful to anyone interested in the last 30 years of history and explaining what it feels like to live today. Please check it out. Uh, and we look forward to having you back again soon. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for your time. 